The Boy of the Painted Cave, chapters 12, 13, and 14. Chapter 12. With Greybeard gone, Tao felt a new sense of emptiness. He spent much of his time drawing mammoths, bison, and rhinos in Greybeard's little cavern. Each evening, he stood up on the top of the cliff, scanning the valley, waiting for the old man to return. As the days passed and Greybeard did not show up, the boy became impatient. Why does he not come back, he thought. He has always kept his word. Maybe something is wrong. He considered going to find him, but he knew he could not cross the river or go into the lands of the other people. Each day, the boy waited with growing concern. Then one morning, down in the slough, Ram growled and Tao looked up to see Greybeard standing in the middle of the glade as if he had come out of the earth. He had his flint-tipped spear in his hand, and he carried the shoulder blade of a horse strapped to his back. Tao hurried toward him with an expression of joy and relief in his eyes. I am happy to see you, old shaman. It has been a long time. Greybeard nodded. There are many places I must go, and I do not walk as fast as I used to. The old man coughed and passed a shaky hand across his brow. Tao winced as he saw the worn face, the pinched cheekbones. He was worried, but he knew the old man would not want him to show concern. The cave is ready, Tao said, but first you must rest and eat. He took some dried meat and fish from his leather pouch, and they sat with their backs against the old red oak and ate their meal. Tao wondered if Greybeard remembered his promise. When they were finished, they started across the valley. Greybeard stopped many times, poking around the stream beds and gravel banks with the shaft of his spear, searching. Then he found what he was looking for. He picked up a stick and dug out the handful of bright red earth. Here, he said, as he poured it into an empty leather sack. This will make good red paint. Now we must find yellow and whites. I have yellow clay, said Tao. The old man did remember. Good. We can dig up some limestone powder near the foot of the cliffs. That will mix well for the lighter colors. When they had all the red, white, and yellow earth they needed, they went up to the top of the cliff using the easy path that Greybeard had found. They reached the tunnel to the hidden cave and removed the cover of branches to let in the sunlight. In the cave, Greybeard sat on the ground and Tao squatted beside him. The old man poured some of the red earth into one of the saucer-shaped rocks that Tao had collected. Then, using a smooth, round stone, he began grinding it into a fine powder. When it was to his liking, he added some of Tao's fish oil, mixing it into dark red paint. He poured a small amount of this into three other shallow stone dishes. In the first one, he added a lump of yellow clay. In the second, he sprinkled limestone powder. And in the third, he added charcoal dust. Using a small, clean stick for each, he mixed them well, adding the three, color adding the three different colors. Ending with three different colors. A bright orange, a salmon pink, and a dark brown. Tao was amazed. He sat quietly, watching. This, too, was magic, he thought. Greybeard spread out more saucers and began blending shades of yellow, browns, grays, and blacks. Some he mixed with honey, some with the boiled fat and clotted blood with the boar. Next, we must make our brushes, he said. He took a handful of twigs from his pouch and began mashing the ends with the stone until they were soft and ragged. He held one up to the shaft of sunlight beaming through the entrance cave. He turned it around for Tao to see. These are small he said, for painting eyes and the fine lines of hair and fur. He made larger brushes by tying feathers and boar bristles around the ends of long sticks with the strings of vegetable fiber. When all the plant paints and brushes were made, the old man got to his feet. Now, he said, we are ready to paint. Tao held out the shoulder blade of the horse while Greybeard poured spots of the colored paints onto its broad white surface. He handed the boy one of the large brushes, brushes and pointed to Tao's pictures of the rhinos, bison, and mammoths. The boy held his breath. He had never had a brush in his hand before. Which one will I paint? Greybeard smiled. You are the image maker. Paint the one you like best. The mountains that walk, said Tao. The Greybeard, Greybeard nodded, then began. Tao hesitated, glancing at the paints on the shoulder blade, uncertain. You saw the mammoths, said Greybeard. What color were they? Reddish brown. Good, said the old man. Then mix a little black with the red until you have the color you wish. Tao dipped the brush into a spot of black, then mixed it in with the red. He lifted his hand and touched it to the drawing. It was too light, so he dipped it in another dab of black. Again, his brush touched the drawing. He smiled. It was a deep reddish brown, the color he wanted. He continued to dip and touch. Greybeard watched as Tao repeated the motion again and again. He reached out and stopped the boy's hand. 
You are not painting on an antler or a seashell, he said. You are painting on a wall. Do not dab. Swing the brush with your whole arm. Graybeard took the brush and began sweeping it across the drawing, following the lines of the mammoth's body. Tao saw the old man's face brighten as he worked, laying on great swaths of color. He felt the excitement as the picture came to life. Do not be afraid, said Graybeard, his eyes glowing. You can always go over what you do not like. He gave the brush back to Tao and the boy tried again. This time he let his arm go free, swinging the brush across the wall. He mixed gray with yellow to fill in the light areas around the chest and stomach. He painted dark shadows on the shoulders and back to add shading. He saw the mammoth begin to breathe as he filled in the eye and the waving trunk. Please stop here and answer question one. When the painting was finished, Greybeard cracked open the duck eggs. He separated the yolks and set them aside. He poured the whites into a clean cockle shell, stirred them with a stick, and handed the shell to Tao. The boy was puzzled. Well, what is this for? Spread it over your painting and you will see. With a feather brush, Tao washed the egg white over the picture. This time, the mammoth came alive with bright new colors. He stared at it in surprise. This had been done by his own hand. He smiled. Never had he been so happy. The following morning, Greybeard went off on his mission of mercy and magic. He was gone for long periods, but he always returned to the little cavern at the top of the cliff to show the boy more about the painting. How to make light and shadows, where to find the red and yellow earth with which to make colors. Sometimes they sat together on the edge of the cliffs talking. Here they looked up at the night sky and Greybeard pointed out the stars, the first one to appear each night, the ones that were red and the ones that always led to the north. Here, too, Greybeard showed him how to make fire and told him where to find special herbs to cure sickness. The last time the old man went off on his journey, Tao and Ram walked with him across the valley. When they reached the river, Greybeard turned. Your drawings are better now. They are true and they begin to leave. Maybe now you can call yourself a cave painter. I thank you for that, said Tao, and for all the things you have taught me. I am happy. The old man smiled. You know the many beautiful things you can make with a brush and a dab of paint. That is all you have to know. That is all that really matters. They said goodbye, and as the old man walked away, Tao heard the long, hacking cough. He noticed the weary, shambling gait. His heart ached, and deep inside, he was afraid for his old friend. Please stop here and answer question two. Chapter 13 One afternoon, Tao and Ram were up in the mountains above the tree line hunting ptarmigan. They were on their way down when Tao looked below to see Volt and the clan hunters stalking a herd of red deer through the spruce forest. The herd was made up of two does with fawns, together with a few yearlings. Tao counted them on his fingers. There were nine in all. The wolf dog was eager to attack, but the boy held him back. They watched quietly from a distance as the hunters formed a large circle surrounding the unwary animals. If Tao could only get close enough for Ram to run in and pull down one of the deer, it would show how well the wolf dog could hunt. Cautiously, he led Ram down to the edge of the spruce wood as the hunters moved silently through the tree trees, getting ready to throw their spears. Unaware of the approaching danger, the deer grazed peacefully on moss and lichen. Tao's heart raced as the hunters crept closer to the unsuspecting deer. If he let the wolf dog go too soon, it would spook the animals and they would get away. He moved silently, slowly, trying to get as close as possible. Even if Ram could not catch one of the animals, he might be able to drive them into the spears of the waiting hunters. Tao knew it would have to be done at just the right moment. The wolf dog was ready to spring and the boy could feel the tension in his body. In the middle of the wood, the deer was still browsing quietly. The hunters moved like leopard cats, slowly closing the circle. At that moment, Toss saw a full-grown doe near the edge of the herd. Tall and chestnut brown, she was the leader of the herd, and her black, liquid eyes were alert, searching for danger. Ram could easily reach her within a few strides, but Tao waited. It was still too soon. Stay, he whispered. The wolf dog's body was trembled under Tao's hold as Ram strained to pull away. Still... Tao waited. Then he saw the big doe flinch. Her head came up and she sniffed the air. If she stamped and gave the alarm, the entire herd would disappear like wind. He saw her body stiffen as she sensed danger and Tao could wait no longer. 
With a quick nudge, he pushed Ram ahead. Now, he whispered, go! The wolf dog dashed out, running straight for the deer. With great bounding leaps, he raced between the spruce trees and passed through the ring of hunters, closing on his prey. The doe stamped and turned quickly, springing into the air. With a single leap, she spun around. For a flickering moment, both animals were blurred into one, and Tao was sure the wolf dog had made his kill. But when he looked again, he saw the big doe bounding away in the opposite direction. Quickly, Ram swerved to cut her off. It was too late. The deer were already strides ahead of him. Tao groaned as he saw the rest of the herd scatter and all of the deer escape through the ring of hunters. In his excitement, he had let Ram go too quickly. He heard the hunters grumbling and cursing, staring after the fleeting deer. Please stop here and answer question three. Tao stood at the edge of the spruce wood, a sinking feeling in his heart as he saw Ram come walking through the trees. Then he saw Garth jump out of the underbrush, directly in the wolf dog's path, threatening him with a spear. Ram crouched on the forest floor, his slitted eyes staring up at the leader, his hair along his back bristling. Ghost of evil, roared Volt, stalking up behind Garth. Scourge of demons, I will cut out your black heart. Tao knew neither Volt nor Garth had seen him yet, and for one awful moment he waited in the shadows. Then he saw Volt raise his arm. With all his strength, he hurled the spear straight at the crouching animal. But Tao was already vaulting through the air, throwing himself between Ram and the flying spear. His hand struck the wooden shaft of the weapon, knocking it to the ground. Volt spun around. He looked at Tao, then at the wolf dog, then back at Tao again, a puzzled expression on his face. Then slowly, Volt began to understand, and a burning fury filled his dark eyes. Pa! he cried almost spitting out the word. So this is how you hunt alone. You and this evil beast are one. Please stop here and answer question four. No, said Tao, trying to explain. The wolf dog is not bad. He is no evil demon. He is a good hunter. He, he has helped me bring much gain to the clan people. The big man scowled darkly, shaking his woolly head. No, he sneered. This beast is the soul of the devil, and you call him friend. He reached up and rubbed the scars of, on his cheek with the back of his hand. This demon and his kind have hunted, haunted me all my life, and I will kill every last one of them. Garth stepped toward Tao, frowning, but Volt had already turned toward the woods. Come, he shouted to the hunters. Help me kill this evil spirit and rid me of this curse. As Volt and Garth watched over the wolf dog, Tao crept into a nearby spruce trees. Tao heard the hunters coming. He knew there was no use in pleading for Ram's life. Volt would not listen. The hunters would not care. Suddenly he jumped away, shouting, Come, Ram, come! The wolf dog sprang between the waiting men, racing after Tao, down through the spruce wood and out across the open meadow. Tao did not look back, but he could hear the cries and shouts as the angry men followed. Dodging, turning, lurching through the tall grass, boy and wolf barely managed to keep ahead of their pursuers. Slipping through the birch strands, Plunging through the high swamp grass, they raced for the slab. Halfway there, Tao saw some of the hunters running to cut him off. His heart sank. The route of escape was blocked. He would have to head for the river. Quickly, he changed direction, leaping over the winding brooks. The bushes and trees became a blur of green. The ground sped away beneath him. He ran through the edge of the oak forest, vaulting along on his spear. His arms grew tired. If only he could stop to hide, to rest and take a quick breath. Then he caught a whiff of smoke. He looked back and saw tongues of yellow flame licking up into the sky. The hunters had started a grass fire to keep him from doubling back. He ran straight ahead and reached a river, stomping under the branches of a giant willow tree. Here he looked around, breathing heavily. The river was an invisible wall. On the far side was the land of the mountain people. For moments he paced the muddy bank with Ram, trying to make up his mind. Then he heard the shouts of the hunters. They were racing ahead of the fire, getting closer. On the other side of the river, the wolf dog would be safe. The hunters would not follow. He looked down at Ram. You must go across the river, he said. Stay there until I call. Ram looked up, whining. Tao pointed to the other shore. Go, he said, pushing the wolf dog into the water. Once, twice, Ram turned back, but Tao kept pushing him into the water. Go, he said sternly. Go now. He threw stones and sticks, chasing the wolf dog farther and further, out into the river. Soon Ram was swimming. 
Tao saw his head bobbing on the water as the current carried him downstream. He watched as a wolf dog pulled himself up on the opposite shore and shook himself off. He saw him look back once or twice, then disappeared into the trees. A moment later, the hunters came crashing through the underbrush. Please stop here and answer question five. Chapter 14 When he heard the hunters coming through the woods, Tao jumped behind the big willow tree. He looked around quickly. There was no place to hide. He was breathing hard and he was too tired to start running again. Then he glanced up into the branches of the willow with its thick canopy of new green leaves. With a wild throw, he hurled his spear into the thicket of thorn brushes, then started up the tree. The massive trunk was growing at a rackish angle and he had little trouble climbing up through the branches. High above the ground, he stretched himself out on a heavy limb the way he'd seen the leopard cats do. He peered down through the curtain of leaves, scarcely daring to breathe. The smell of smoke still hung in the air, but as he looked back across the valley, he saw that the fire had nearly burned itself out. He'd barely settled himself on his rough perch when the hunters came swarming around the foot of the tree. They grunted and shouted and pointed toward the river. They searched around the clumps of thorn brushes and followed the footprints up and down the riverbank. A moment later, Tao saw Volt come into the clearing. The big leader soon found the spear in the thicket. He held it up and showed it to the hunters. Tao was certain they must know he was not far away. He watched as Garth came up and went with Volt down by the river. He could hear them talking and wading through the shallow water, studying the tracks of the wolf dog on the bank. The big leader walked back under the willow tree. He stood there looking around, grunting and shaking the spear as Garth and the other hunters searched the bank. Then slowly, he glanced up into the branches of the willow. Tao held his breath. He pressed his body against the rough bark and felt it dig into his arms and legs. Cautiously, he peered down through the screen of branches and leaves. Volt was still directly below. The big man walked around the tree. He kept looking up, scanning the branch branches. Then he stopped and looked straight at Tao. For a brief moment, their eyes met. The boy was sure he had been discovered. He waited silently, his heart pounding as he dug his fingers into the gray bark. Volt continued to walk beneath the tree, his eyes searching from branch to branch. With a wave of relief, Tao saw him turn away and go down to the river where he joined the other hunters. There, Volt held up the boy's spear and shook it over his head. The fools have crossed the river, he shouted. Garth grunted. Let the mountain people find them. The hunters mumbled to each other and nodded in agreement. Volt shook his fist. Come, he said, pointing his spear toward camp. Let us go back. Tao stayed up on his hidden perch. He was sure Bolt must have seen him. Calling off the hunters might only be a trick to get him down. He waited grimly for darkness. Then he climbed down to the ground, cramped from his long watch. Bone tired, he spent the night huddled in the shadows of the riverbank thinking about Ram. In a few days, if the hunters did not return, he would call the wolf dog back. Please stop here and answer question six. The next morning, still tired and hungry, Tao fished for minnows in the pools and eddies along the riverbank. He had only caught a few when he heard an eerie, drawn-out howl come from across the water. It was a long, mournful, and it drifted over on the misty morning air. It came again and again, echoing through the dank woodlands. The boy listened for a few moments, wondering. He heard it again, louder this time. Suddenly, his body stiffened. It was the howl of a wolf. Tao walked up and down along the riverbank, looking toward the far side where the mountain sloped down to the water and the hemlock and the spruce trees crowded the shore. Again he listened and again he heard the sad, lonely cry. Without waiting longer, he pulled off the deerskin boots, tucked them under his belt, and plunged into the river. He swam steadily, his dark head bobbing above the cold water. The swift current carried him downstream as he made for the opposite shore. When he got close to the bank, he reached out and grabbed an overhanging hemlock branch and pulled himself out of the water. Stepping onto the dry land, he sat down and shoved his feet into the wet boots. He found a broken tree limb and using it as a crutch, he vaulted up through the woods. The howling continued, coming from somewhere on the distant hillside. Tao made his way up through the spruce forest, hobbling over the stones and roots guided by the wailing howl. Desperately, he pushed through the tangle of undergrowth. 
all he could think of was Ram. He saw fresh tracks going up the steep slope, and he knew men had been this way only a short time before. He plunged through a low strand of hemlocks, ducking under the branches, tripping on the creepers. The howling cries were closer now. Suddenly he crashed through a thicket of junipers and stepped into a clearing. There was Ram, lying on the ground alone, his legs lashed to a pole with leather thongs. Then he saw, when he saw the boy, the wolf dog whined and struggled to get free. Tao's angered flare. He ran up to the wolf dog and put his hand on the animal's shoulder. Hold still, he whispered, as he drew his flint knife and began to cut the bindings. Ram squirmed. Tao was almost finished when a heavy voice called out, Let the wolf dog be. The boy whirled around to see a large, red-bearded man dressed in a bearskin robe stepping out of the bushes. The big man glared at him. He held his spear, pointing it at Tao. The boy heard the sound of the footsteps and snatching twig, snapping twigs. A moment later, nine more hunters came out of the underbrush. They were dressed in sheepskin tunics, and all of them carried spears. Tao saw the anger in their eyes. Who are you? asked the red-haired leader. He spoke a language almost like Tao's own. I, I am Tao of the Valley People. The man grunted. He understood. We have watched you across the river with your wolf dog. Now you hunt on our land. No, said Tao. I came only to get Ram. I do not want your game. The big leader shook his head, his eyes flashing defiance. The wolf dog stays, he said. He belongs to us now. Tao's fist tightened around his flint knife, and he stepped forward. Two of the hunters grabbed him by the arms and held him back. The others tied Ram's mouth with fibers and thongs and lifted him up on a long pole. The wolf dog squirmed and struggled, froth dripping from his mouth as he tried to get free. Tao twisted and tried to pull away. Anger surged through him as he saw the hunters carry Ram into the forest. Let the wolf dog go, he said harshly. He has done you no harm. I will leave your land. I will never return. Once again, the man shook his head. Then give me the wolf dog, said Tao. I will hunt with him here and bring you much food. The big leader glanced at the hunters, looking from one to another. They shook their heads, but one said, Maybe the boy speaks wisely. It will be a help to have a wolf dog hunt again. Please stop here and answer question seven. The leader grunted. Come, he said. Bring the boy. We will ask the shaman. Tao turned quickly. Y you, you have the shaman? Yes, said the leader. He rests in our camp. Greybeard? The big man nodded as he strode ahead. He is sick. Tao followed the hunters up through the pine forest to the camp of the mountain people, where a circle of skin huts was set up at the foot of the high ledge. Three women were busy skinning an ebex, while children played with stones near a woodpile. They stopped and looked up, their dark eyes full of curiosity as Tao limped into the clearing. The red-bearded leader took him over to one of the huts, where he reached down and opened the skin flap. Here, said he said, the shaman sleeps. He does not eat, and he grows thin. In the dim light, Tao saw Greybeard lying on a bed of dried grass and skins. The old man lifted his head slowly, his sunken eyes blinking from the light. A spasm of coughs racked his body as he crawled out from the hut. Tao was shocked. He had never seen the old man so thin and feeble. Ah, said Greybeard, his voice weak. The mountain people have brought you. They say I am dying. Please stop here and answer question eight. The boy shook his head. He looked up at the red-bearded leader, unwilling to believe what he had heard. It cannot be, Tao knelt. Greybeard, with rest, you will be well again. Perhaps, said Greybeard. But first, you must help me get back to the land of your people. Tao shook his head again. I cannot go back. Why? The leader looked down. Tell the shaman. Tao looked uneasily at the man, then began. He told Greybeard how he had sent Ram across the river to escape Volt and the clan hunters, and how the mountain people had captured him. The big leader nodded. Now he will stay with us and hunt with the wolf dog. No, said Greybeard. He cannot stay. The leader scowled and went away. Do not worry, said Greybeard to Tao. I will tell them to let the wolf dog go. But if I take Ram back to the valley, my people will kill him. Greybeard held up a hand. If you trust me, 
and do as I say. There will be no danger. Tao frowned. I do not understand. The old man smiled weakly. The Longhorns have come back into the high plains. Tomorrow is the day of the hunt. Tonight we will paint images of the great bulls on the walls of the secret cavern. Tao was stunned. But I am not a chosen one. The elders will not accept me. <sighs> I have trained you, said Greybeard, breathing heavily, and I will give the word so that the clan people will know. You will make the spirits of the Longhorns live in the secret cavern. Please stop here and answer question nine. But you are still the cave painter. No, Tao. I can no longer lift my arms or hold a brush. Then you must rest and get well, and you will paint again. The old man bent over, coughing badly. <coughs> there is no time. Even now the herds are on the high plains. The hunters are waiting. There are others. None as good as you. Your images are true and will please the spirits. Tao shook his head. It is a long journey. I can walk slowly. You are like an old boar, said the boy. You will not give up. If you will not do this for me, I will try to do it myself. Tao sighed and threw up his hands. <sighs> then we must start now. Greybeard spoke with the leader of the mountain people again. They released Ram, and Tao was glad to see him safe and unharmed. Still in a daze, with the sun still high in the sky, Tao helped the old man down through the spruce forest. They moved slowly, with Ram running on ahead, leading the way. They came to a river where Tao built a platform of willow branches and tied them together with vines. Greybeard sat cross-legged on the makeshift raft, and the boy pushed it out into the stream. It bobbed and tossed with a current, sending a showers of cold water drenching the old man. Tao winced as he saw Greybeard shivering with cold. When they reached the far shore, the boy wanted to stop and build a fire to let the old man rest and dry off. But Greybeard shook his head, dragging himself along, his teeth chattering. We must be there before dark, he said. As Tao helped the old man along, his mind was filled with fear and doubt. All he knew now was that somehow, tonight, he would become a cave painter. Please stop here and answer question 10.